Hey, everybody. I am very honored, honored to have Carl Kennedy here, uh, a man that has a finger in a many, many pies, uh, known for the rods, Thrasher, and also Kennedy. How you doing, Carl? I'm doing great, Ralph. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for being here. Uh, we have met. It was about, I think, two years ago. You were here where I live, Hialeah, Florida. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Recording with St. James. And I think that was the uh, 450s. I believe so. Well, oh, was it? I thought it was. Yes. James. But it had. Well, it's, it's Jimmy and Bob from St. James. So I could see where you'd be confused. Oh, okay. And um, I was the guy that showed up in the studio with the Rod shirt and a bunch of Rod's albums for you to sign. Yeah, I remember. I have a picture of it somewhere. That's right. Yeah, we took pictures, and I went with mm -hmm. the drummer of Ingbe, the kid, the young guy. Yep, Brian Wilson, good kid. Yeah, great. Good, great drummer. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, I, I'm his friend, Ralph. And, uh, yeah, and you were nice enough to give me your number. I lost your number, so maybe you can give it to me later if you want. No, you get it one time, Ralph. That's it. <laughs> well, hey, lucky you. <laughs> no no calls at 3 in the morning from me. <laughs> But uh, so, so Carl, you're so busy. Oh, and I also want to thank you for giving me the amazing Kennedy album, Headbanger. I love that CD that you gave me. Thank you. I appreciate that. There was, know, that, was, that was a labor of love for me, so I really appreciate you saying that. As well as Warrior, right? Uh, the Warrior album? Warrior with Kennedy, that's, um, you know. That's one that's you know near and dear. That's its band, you know, and we have we're working on the second album now, and it's going well. I'm excited about it. That's awesome. <clears throat> so, so that's that's your latest project now. Well, the project that's out right now is the 450s. Right, and, and is that the same one you recorded here at Fernie's? It is, as a matter of fact. Right on. So it took mm -hmm. a while for it to come out. Well, COVID hit. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I figured. COVID kind of put a damper on a lot of things. So t tell us, I've heard, I've heard it while you were recording and mixing up, but tell us more about it. Well, you know, the singer, Rhett, he um, was a singer in Young Turk, and he and I were, you know, worked together for a long time, and I managed and produced him for both Geffen and um, uh, A&M, or Virgin, Geffen and Virgin albums. And so we've been friends for a long time. I was working with Rock's Gang in Tampa, and he was 19, and he convinced me to fly to Miami. I didn't want to do it. He kept saying, come on, fly down here, fly down here before you go back. And I was like, I'd been, in, been working down there for about three months. I was like, I want to go home. But uh, he kept convincing me, just fly down here. And so I flew in, met with him at the airport. I liked him. And uh, then I flew home and wound up working with him. Nice. So the guys in St. James, same thing. I've recorded with them. We, you know, the albums the album was out a couple of years ago. And uh, I was like the de facto drummer because they they were like Spinal Tap. Their drummers would all implode. Okay. Um, for some reason, I don't know what would happen, but it was always something. One's girlfriend hated it, um, forced him to come home before he recorded Another one was gambling. He was on the phone watching a TV while we were trying to record gambling, placing bets with his mother. Um, another one just came in and he just wasn't prepared and had a bad attitude. So um, another one got really sick and got me sick. And so he wound up going home. I wound up playing the drum tracks. And um, they said, I would, they just reminded me recently that between takes, I would lie on the floor and listen because I had dengue fever. I was so sick. And I remember, I remember driving myself to the emergency room and the nurse was freezing cold out, bitter winter. And um, I go in and I have high fever and she looks at me and she says, oh, honey, you're really sick. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know. So I finished the drum tracks for that, but we've all been friends. And then throughout that, uh, Young Turk guys and the St. James guys all became good friends. So they'd always wanted to work together. And that's how this came about, just out of mutual friendship. Awesome. And uh, and how about uh, St. You know, I got uh, from a member of St. James nice enough to send me the album. Um, 
I think it was a self title. Uh, what you guys released the self title? It has a train on the cover. Yes, that's Resurgence. Okay, yeah, great, great, awesome album that I have on vinyl. That if you ever come back down here, I'd like for you to sign it. No, nope. you got we had the one chance with the phone number and the autographs. Oh man, this <laughs> this ain't going well there, Carl. <laughs> Yeah, listen, Ralph. I'll cave. I'll cave by the time I get there. I'll cave. I'm going to charm you by the end of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, you have your you have your um uh, fingers in many pies and uh, how about the Rods? I mean, that last Rods album I, I'm I'm not saying this cuz you're on here. I think it may be like my favorite Rods album. Thanks. I agree. I agree. I think was a great tie-in from the first album to the this last album brotherhood of metal i agree i think it was a was a a progression but i think it was um you know a really strong effort on our part which was exciting to do I'm proud of it that um you know in later years we still came up with some great product yes and the rods have rods are, are moving forward we've got uh, david has five songs he's written we have he just wrote another one i heard a couple days ago and we have um, another song that the singer mike has written and that we're working on so that's seven songs and uh, we may do a couple of remakes as well so you know we're moving along with that and and you go, <clears throat> you go way back uh you had a band called raw meat correct mm-hmm and that was around the time Alf was playing. It was. So you were friendly with them even back then. Exactly. Yeah, I knew those guys, and we rehearsed. We and rehearsed in a Finnish garage. They rehearsed in the house, and so we were always crossing paths. And you know, and plus, I would go see Elf. They were like a concert band, even though they would play high school dances. Nobody danced. Everybody sat on the floor and. You know, watched in awe. It was amazing. They were such a great band, and it's it's sad in a way that there wasn't enough video or a way to capture the audio and the video of the band back then because you know it was only a really a few years from that version of Elf to the Richie Blackmore or the Elves, you know, or Elf um, touring. And, you know, the rainbow, Richie Blackmore's rainbow. I mean, it was, wasn't was like the band just suddenly got great. They were great. It was just they got discovered. And uh, so, you know, it was a great time to watch. It was fantastic. This was uh, the elves, not the electric elves? Well, it was the electric elves, then it became the elves. And then when they signed to Epic, it became Elf. Right. And that's where you and Dave uh, got uh, became friends, right, around that time? Yeah, I mean, we were really acquaintances, you know, more than friends. We didn't become friends until after the, you know, after when David was um, out of Elf, even though I, you know, like I said, I knew the guys and would see them, but we didn't really become good friends until after that. We started working together on a project um, after David Feinstein's Thunder. We started working on some material together. And then from there, we wound up starting the Rods. And what an incredible band. You know, uh, when you guys played, because I'm all the way in Miami, so actually I was born up in uh, Terrytown. You know Terrytown because you're... I, yeah, I do. <clears throat> That's where I was born, but... Which if you're in from Manhattan area, Brooklyn, Manhattan, all that, that's upstate. If you're from upstate New York, it's downstate. Uh, were you were you above uh, Terrytown or below it? Yeah, we're above Terrytown. Well. I'm in Pennsylvania now, but Cortland, New York is it's above Binghamton and Binghamton is about two hour and a half from Terrytown. Right on. Heading south, you know, so. So I, I know the first album was released in 1980, but uh, you guys were probably formed in the 70s, right? We started in early spring of 79. Oh, well, that was pretty good. And no, I, you know, I was, you know, gloating about uh, Brotherhood of Metal, but my God, man, th those early albums. And I got to say one really, I mean, a lot of it's like, you know, uh, it's so 
um, what's the word I'm looking for? It it was very, a lot of people knew about the Rods down here in Miami. And uh, mm-hmm. I got to say, man, I don't know how you feel about this album, but there's something so special for me for the Rods Live, the 1983 album. Mm-hmm. It has this vibe, like, you know, yeah, there's many albums you feel like you're there, but this one, it really feels like you're there. Like, uh, the song Born a Rock, where there's like a little pause and you hear a guy in the audience go, woo! <laughs> it was, <laughs> it's just the coolest thing ever, you know? I was like, God, you really feel like you're there. What do you feel about the Rods Live now looking back on it? I think it captured, you know, the band. We were we were doing dates with Motorhead. We were doing our own little tour. Um, it, it was a stressful time in a way because we were carrying a mobile unit. Bart Curtis brought his mobile unit, and uh, you know, it was a it was trying. But by the same token, it was it captured the band at that moment in time, and it was a. It's great to have that because as a band, you evolve, things change, you change your styles, you evolve, and so kind of captured the band at a very cool period in time when they were when we were really strong as a live band and doing a lot of dates so you know preserve that right and uh i never had the pleasure to see you guys uh back then but uh when i heard you guys were playing the new jersey uh it was a hurricane uh, relief show i think it was right uh, Mm -hmm. with anvil twist sister i seriously i got on a plane for the rods Really? And I really did. I mean, wow. I, I love, you know, the TT Quick reunion. I love metal. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, those guys are great. Well, you yeah. know what? Yeah. I'm going to give you, I'll have to give you my number now for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's very kind of you to say. I'm sure that wasn't the whole reason, but that was very kind of you. The amount of talent on those that stage that night was amazing. And John Albino kept it together. He was stage manager he's a phenomenal guitarist and musician but um he kept that all those egos and all that craziness he kept it together yeah and it was it was a ripping show and you guys were just amazing you know it's just so great to hear you know to witness you know let them eat metal and hurricane and you know it was just a, a great amazing show and i was just seriously i i loved every band on there but I, I saw, I've seen every band on there, except for T.T. Quick, but I, I really wanted to see the Rods. Mm-hmm. And uh, you did you did uh, work with some T.T. Quick. Uh, you did produce one of the albums? I did, the first EP, yes. You've done a lot. You know, uh, I know because I've seen your, your, your name on a lot of these albums and uh, uh, Fistful of Metal. I'd like to talk about that. Because you did the first three Anthrax releases, um, Armed and Dangerous and Spreading the Disease. And correct me if I'm wrong, was it you that uh, told Anthrax about Joey? That's correct, yeah. I, I wasn't really happy with their singer. And, uh, you know, he was a young, young guy, you know, certainly had some talent, but he... Um, he wasn't the right singer for Anvil and for Anthrax at that time. And so I let it, I made it known to them. And then uh, it was an interesting story how that went. I just, those guys were so pro and uh, they just, they were so focused on their career. In the middle of recording that album, they, their second album, which was the critical album for them, they said, well, you know, tell Johnny. So I called Johnny. I told him what was up. Johnny said, put the band on the phone. The band went into the conference room. Five minutes later, they said, Johnny wants to talk to you. I go to the conference room. I pick up the phone. John said, put him on a bus and hung up the phone. So there we were with no singer. So I put out the word and my friend, Andrew Duck McDonald, that I did the Thrasher album with. He had been working with Joey and he said, you know, try out Joey. Joey's a great singer. So we brought him in and the rest is history. So you you knew Joey before that? I didn't know Joey. Oh, you did? I didn't know. No, Duck Duck is the one who said, you know, call Joey and talk to him. So I did and brought him in. So um, so working was it easier working when Joey was in the band, or was it the same? Well, totally different. I mean, Joey was coming in from having been singing 
like Journey and, you know, that kind of classic rock stuff. And, you know, if you remember that what Anthrax was doing was changing of the guard music, it was new. And so he needed a little adjustment time, you know, speeds were different. And, um, you know, he was singing somebody else's lyrics and so on. So it was a little bit of an adjustment period for him, but, you know, he picked it up on the run. I mean, he was, he nailed it, as you can hear. I mean, you can, proof is in the pudding on the, the recordings. You can hear how great he did. But, but you know, at first it was, a, he needed a little time and, you know, we gave it to him and then he, he did great. That's awesome. And and this this is all due to Johnny Z, correct? That you produced many of them? Yes. Mm -hmm. From back then. How did you uh, meet Johnny Z back then? I think that I had heard someone was working with him and that he had was signing bands and I wanted to get into production. So I called Johnny and we hit it off. And he said, he's still a really great friend of mine, Johnny and Marsha. Fantastic. And, you know, rest in peace, Marsha. She was a wonderful woman. Um, but Johnny and I are still close and, and we talk quite often and, you know, we just hit it off and remain friends all these years. So he was kind enough to, let me produce some of his bands that he signed. Uh, very iconic albums now. You did Feel the Fire, uh, mm -hmm. the Overkill album. Did that, uh, how was that like? Because that was a very young Overkill that this is their first experience in the studio, I would guess, or a full like that. I just played a show in uh, House of Blues in, in uh, Anaheim two years ago. And I got to see Bobby for the first time in years and years and years. And uh, it was, you know, he's such a great guy. And, uh, you know, Bobby just hasn't changed. And I think he's such a great singer. Dee Dee was phenomenal. Great bass player. And Rat, you know, really, they're just all good guys. Yeah. Uh, Gustafson lives down here now. And mm -hmm. I run into him quite a bit. He's in uh, the band Violence now. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh and also uh you did great my, player great oh player. amazing amazing player he he actually played on uh a song that we, we did an overkill cover and he was kind enough to do the solo on it um another two albums that to me are historic and has held up a lot that you had you, you produced uh were the the two exciter albums um which actually were, i only produced um Violence. Say that again. Violence and Force. Violence and Force. Yeah. Well, I, I, thought, have, I have all the album covers on the back, <laughs> right behind me. I was going to turn around and look. Yeah, what great guys they are! They're really, really talented. So powerful live. Dan, such a. It's amazing he can play drums with that much power and sing with that much power at the same time. Same time. Very impressive. But they're they're really good guys. Was it was it a situation where he played drums and sang on the record, or was that separate? No, they did the. We recorded the music, and then he overdubbed his vocals. Right, right. Well, those two albums, uh, they're still very well. I thought you had something to do with Heavy Metal Maniac. I'm wrong, huh? No, I didn't do that one. They did that in Canada, maybe. I'm not sure. Okay, because that well, Vons and Force to me was the the best one though. That's but I love. Heavy Metal Maniac as well. So when when uh, what happened before all this? You went to school or something for producing? No, I had always been involved in producing, always been involved in arranging. And, you know, I started playing guitar. Same time I started playing drums and dabbled in a little, like, you know, self-taught piano and whatever. So, but so I'd always been interested in that. And, uh, you know, I had a girlfriend who was at Elmira College and, they had these little mono tape recorders, and so I got her and one of her girlfriends to each sign one out, and I would just record and bounce them from track to track. And from there, every time I went to the studio, I would just watch and learn. Interesting. And another uh, thing I remember, well, how I got turned on to the Rods was the Hurricane video. Now, that's, it's primitive, but it's so good. That, that, that video, um, how did that come about? Uh, we needed a video, and <laughs> we just didn't have any money, and we needed to do something. So we got uh, John Petrie, I think, directed that. And um, we had the car on a trailer. So it's going down the road. We're, we're actually up on a trailer. Car's being towed. <laughs> and, uh, 
and uh, that was it. We didn't really have anyone. My friend Victoria, all of our friends, Victoria, she um, agreed to participate. And so, you know, that was it. I mean, we just went to a garage, our friend Gary Dallaire, Pete Dallaire's garage, and uh, and Bill Dallaire, that was their dad. And so Pete let us use the garage, and we so we recorded some in there, video, did the video there, and we did, I can't remember where, there was some hall or something that we did, some of the live shots, the music scenes. So anyway, it's primitive, but it's cool. It's awesome. But you know what? I, I'm a fan of that type of video more than, you know, the big production, because there's something so real and organic about music videos that are like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like the 450s videos. Like we've we've augmented those, but we recorded all the live footage at uh, the studio when you uh, were there. Yeah, and and uh, that's up on YouTube now because I I've not watched that yet. It is. I'm surprised you didn't get that from the publicist that all the the material that's out, including the uh, you know the press kit, electronic press kit with all the songs and photos and tons of photos from the studio. But yeah, there's. We're on our, we have two videos out now, and we're going to we'll have two more. The album comes out November 18th, I believe. But, um, you know, we're starting to get some traction now. So, the second so video. What, what are the names of the video so people can check it out? First video is Flowers for Columbine. And uh, there's going to be a lyric video for that as well. And then the second single is Lucy Walk Away, and that video's out now. That's on YouTube, but it's Lucy Walk Away. And there'll be a lyric video that will follow that's actually really cool as well. So That's awesome, man. And so, then Lust and Denial will be, will be the third single from the album. That'll be coming out in another couple of weeks. Well, I know I'm going all over the place, but I got to go back again. Um, the, the Lone Rager. Um, mm. That, that uh, well, you know, I mean, there was no such thing as m a metal rap back then. Uh -huh. I believe it was the first one ever, correct? I agree. I believe so, too. So it was like Johnny Z one day would say, I want to record something, Carl. That's what it was. He <laughs> just said, you know, I want, I've got this, these lyrics and I want to do something. So what happened was we, uh, I'm trying to think. What it was, I think we, we were in the studio, David and Gary were there. We came up with this little riff for him and, uh, you know, for the song for him. And Marsha sang or Marsha brought in a children's choir. She directed the children's choir, did a great job. The kids were fantastic. And uh, she, she really did, did a great job with the kids, handled them so well. And Johnny did his part. And uh, and then I think. David had to go. I don't think he could stay another day. And I think on the second day, Duck was there and Duck played played some solos on the... So we had... Because we only had one. Back then, we were putting it out as a single, right? So there were two sides. And I think Duck played over the instrumental. We removed the vocal. And uh, Duck played the solo over the, the, in, the whole instrumental track. So we had two, two versions of the song. Oh, I, I only... I Wait, are, are both versions on the vinyl? Because I do own that vinyl. I had you sign it, actually. Uh, that's a good question. It's hanging on the wall, but, you know, I can't get it out to see, so I don't know. Yeah. I know I, there was a single with it. I have to ask John. Maybe I'll call him later. Um, I'll have to ask John about that because we did have the instrumental, so maybe it is on the vinyl. Actually, it probably is. It's probably side B. You are uh, correct. Yeah, the, you are correct. The vinyl. Yes, you are correct. I'm looking at it now. It is an instrumental on the other side. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Now, here's something very, very interesting that I didn't know till today. Um, the Rods opened for Ozzy on the Blizzard of Oz tour. Yes, we did several dates with them. How was that? It was amazing. You know, that was with Randy Rhodes in the band. It was incredible. And... Like the first, like we're in our, we're in our dressing room and uh, at the Landmark Theater, and we're down the hall from you know their dressing rooms. And Rudy was great. Gary had forgotten a bass bass strap, so Rudy was kind enough to you know loan him one. And uh, but we we we're in our dressing room. And suddenly we hear these guitar riffs, 
it's so loud that we couldn't talk next to each other in the in the room. And I don't know what Randy had in the room, like a half Marshall stack or a full Marshall stack, but it was deafening. But he was playing some amazing things. Not what he played on the record, but, you know, he was playing, which was really then a very new style of playing with all the modes and, and uh, sweet picking and so on. He was really killing it. And, and his warm-ups were just blazing. And so we were just in awe. Like, wow. And, uh, you know, then to doing the date was cool. And I know with the, at the Landmark Theater, I remember playing my solo. And Tommy Aldrich, I look over and Tommy Aldrich is peering from the side stage watching me play. And when he caught my eye, he, like, darted back. But, uh, you know, didn't want me to see him. But, you know, I'm sure he was there watching because... I stole a ton of stuff from him. So he's probably wondering who's, who's playing all my, my fills poorly. That's amazing. And were, did you guys have any interaction with, uh, I know Rudy, yes, but with Ozzy or Randy or, or Tommy? Um, well, you know, we saw, say hi to Ozzy, but Ozzy would shut down like, like at the arena and, and Utica was the first, first one that, you just shut it. They shut it down. They'll tell you to go to your room and lock your they lock it down because Ozzy would walk the halls then before the show, and didn't want people around. So that happened. Um, but you know, so we saw Ozzy and said hi. Sharon was cool, and uh, you know everybody was cool. Tommy was, you know, I, I've told the story and it's you know I feel badly kind of in a way, but you know he was a jerk to me, so I'll tell the story. Um, he was there with Ox, who was someone from Cortland. Now, some of these bands, uh, Rainbow, Deep Purple, Deep Purple still has uh, the keyboard player from Elf um, on tour with them. You know, so there's these people from Cortland, a lot of the road crew for Def Leppard and so on, came from Cortland. Musicians we used. My drum tech was drum tech for uh, Bon Jovi for years for Tico. So Ox was there, and they were sitting by the truck bay, and I walked up to um, um, <laughs> to to him and uh, to Tommy, and I said, Tommy, you know, you're just a huge influence on me. I just think you're such a great drummer, and I just wanted to say hi. And he turned his head. Nice. Didn't say a word. Just turned his head away from me, and Ox looked at me and shrugged his shoulders like, sorry, man. Oh man, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that was it. You know, so I always warn people: be careful, you know, meeting your idols because it can be a little bit different experience than you were expecting. You know, I heard something similar uh, when he was in Thin Lizzy because he actually John Sykes fronted Thin Lizzy for a while, and they played down here. And my friend told me pretty much the same thing. He went up to Tommy, you know, because he's a big fan. And he's a drummer too, and he said that. Tommy pretty much blew him off. And that was maybe like 25 years later. So mm -hmm. I don't think he's changed much. Well, that's too bad. But uh, I thought maybe he might have been having a bad day. But, uh, you know, some people, it's the way they are. I yeah. Know. Well, I'm like, I'm sure one of your heroes, uh, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, taught you? Uh, yeah, Car Carmine. Carmine Apiece was your teacher at one point? Yeah, Tom, I, Carmine and Tony Williams were two, you know, two of my favorite drummers. And uh, Carmine probably be, being by far the number one drummer from Vanilla Fudge and whatever. It's just a huge, and Cactus, and just a huge influence on me. And uh, so getting to take lessons, I was probably 19, I think, 20. When I started taking lessons, I saw an ad in the Musicians Union paper, Carmine Apathy. So I called up and. I thought, oh, I'll dial the number. And Aunt, Aunt Carmine asked his phone. I was expecting some kind of receptionist. I don't know what I was expecting. And uh, he said, you know, may I speak with Carmine? He goes, this is Carmine. So mm -hmm. I arranged for, you know, the lesson. And I studied with him for about a year. And I was living in Boston shortly after that. And I would still drive in and take double lessons from Carmine. Wow. So, so but he was, he was so great. And, and he never, I... You know, I've tried to tell him a couple of times, Carmen just doesn't want to hear it. But like, I can't say enough about how he changed my drumming so much so that I wouldn't have had the career I have 
um, I've had without him teaching me and changing things because what he did was I was self-taught prior to that. I had a really crappy teacher early on who told me I sucked. And, you know, eventually I just stopped taking lessons because, you know, paying somebody to tell you you suck, like you can get that from your friends for free. So <laughs> I just, uh, you know, stopped taking lessons. So by the time I got to Carmine, I had some bad habits, even though I was passionate about the drums. And Carmine would be like really cool about things. He'd say, you know, that's wrong, but that's cool. So keep that. And then he would say, but, you know, here's another way to play. And he would tell me, you know, balance yourself and, you know, play with, you don't have to play like with so much energy. You can, you know, play and still get the same amount of volume. And he just helped me so much, you know, aside from reading and going through his book and syncopation and whatever, he, um, he was very positive. He was just so, so great. I mean, I can't say enough about between lessons and ripping off everything I could from every album he did. Um, you know, what a huge, huge influence on me, on my playing. So sometimes meeting your heroes does pay off. Well, absolutely. They're not all dicks like some people we know. <laughs> yeah, like Tommy Aldridge. Like Tommy Aldridge. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I got to say, meeting you, you couldn't have been nicer uh, to me and Brian. I mean, Brian was in awe. I mean, Brian doesn't live close to Hialeah. He drove like a good hour down here to, because he's the one yeah. that we were going to be there. And I was like, what? So, we, and you were just so nice to us. You gave us your number. You even uh, gave us the CDs and you signed all the stuff. You couldn't have been nicer. You're a very down to earth person. And I really do appreciate how you treated us. Especially. Well, that's nice to hear. I'm glad. Well, it was nice meeting you guys. And I was, you know, please, I was honored that you guys took the time to come and say hi. Oh, it was, it was our, it was our uh, honor, believe me, because you know, it's not every day you get the drummer of the rods come, you know, to your hometown, you know. And what a, what a cool studio that is, isn't it? Fernie is a, Fernie is a riot and he's a great, great guy. But yeah. uh, that studio is so cool with the, Heads from the killer clowns right up above where you're playing. I mean, so such a great vibe in that place. Oh, exactly. That's where we rehearse. Every time our band rehearses, we go to Fernie. And he has another rehearsal studio on the other side, right? right yeah, side of the mm-hmm. warehouse. That's where we usually uh, we we have rehearsed in that one, but we usually go to the other one that has a stage. And uh, you were in that one, the one with the stage. I've never seen that. I really wanted to go, but I was busy, and it just seemed like. People were in there, so I never got to go. Yeah, it was nice, but where you were was was much more spacious, and it sounds mm-hmm. better in that room. But because that's more of a recording uh, facility, where the other one was just to practice, you know. Yeah, it has couches and such. Well, you know, uh, Carl, I can't thank you enough, man. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope you had fun. I hope you give me your number now. <laughs> you got it. I will definitely give you my number. I won't give it to you now. No, no. We'll, we'll, when, we're, when we're done, because it, of some course. people have had my number, and uh, I would have gotten calls at four in the morning. The effing rods rule, man. <laughs> I'm like, oh, thank you so much. At four in the morning, you had to call and tell me. Well, you're lucky. But yeah. You're lucky, Carl, because I, I don't drink anymore, so. I won't be doing excellent. It. Right. I would I would have been like one of those people if you gave me that uh, like eight years ago. I probably would have done that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But uh, well, listen, so yeah. yes, thank thank you, Ralph. I really appreciate the support. I mean, the four fifties are a new band, and uh, you know, so we need all the support we can get. So I appreciate it. I will plug it a lot. I have a uh, twenty four no twenty five thousand subscribers on the YouTube and uh, wow nice. Yeah, so I, I will get the word out, and you know I've I've talked about the Rods regularly, and and I even promoted the St. James album, and uh, and oh, I will, thank you. I will uh, promote this as well. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Ralph. Thank you so much, and uh, have a good one, Carl. You too. Bye bye. All right, bro.